And I knew that being broke was easier than being broken. Mm. Being broke, yeah. I just need to go find out how to make money. Being yeah. broken, I need to find the willpower and the desire to get up. Well, your imagination is everything, really. You know, you can use your imagination to bring the future into the present. And that alters the vibration you're in and alters everything in your life. You know, you said something very critical in the opening you talked about. It's, a, it's an inner, it's an inner yeah. game. And I knew that my external circumstances in 1994, if I pick a year, I could I could pick 92, I could pick 97, because there was a period of time, there wasn't a moment, there was a period of time. Yeah. But in 1994, if I pick a moment, um, uh, I was broke and broken. And I knew that being broke was easier than being broken. Mm. Being broke, yeah. I just need to go find out how to make money. Being yeah. broken, I need to find the willpower and the desire to get up mm. and mm. the belief in myself yeah to tell someone I was worthy of being paid. That was the hardest journey. And um, I had my son in 1994, which it was a combination of the most beautiful time in my life and the lowest point in my life, mm -hmm. because it was the time that I had something outside of me, my child, something that I saw my heart for the first time outside of my chest. Yeah. And I was willing to um, kill away my ego or my shego for this child. And I had to eight months after he was born when I had to go get on government's assistance. Yeah. And I had to stand in the line and ask someone to help me pay my bills and to help me feed my child. And it was one of the most humbling experiences of my life because I was very independent. I had been working since I was 14. And at 28, I just hit, I hit a place that I didn't know was rock bottom until I kept feeling that feeling something on my back going I think that I think that's the bottom through circumstances <laughs> right. you know yeah. and one of those circumstances was when he was eight months old I, I ran out of Pampers and I went to the ATM to get twenty dollars out to get my son Jelani Pampers and it said insufficient funds mm. and um, I was just saying the other day I was delivering a, a sermon at a church and I said people I, I was interviewed 155 times in a five-month period um, because I was the first uh, woman in the self-development industry to get paid a million dollars to write one book. And it just created a lot of buzz, and I was, I'm very grateful for it. And everyone kept asking me the same question. What did you do? What did you do? What was the moment? What was the moment? And everyone was looking for a moment. So I started looking for a moment. Like, yeah. what was the moment? Because it wasn't a moment. But if I had to give it a moment... I, I said to, to a lot of people that interviewed me, I said, listen, I said, I don't know if you remember that thing that made you decide. But I remember that thing that made me decide. It said $11.42. That I looked at that 18, I looked at that balance and it was at uh, 7 Eleven. I'll never forget. Mm, That's yeah. how broken my life was. I was banking at 7 Eleven. <laughs> I was just going to the ATM, paying all the extra charges because I didn't even want to go to the bank. Yeah. I knew I had some NFS, NSF checks there. So just, so just everything was in chaos. And I saw 1142 and I didn't know in the, at the time that that was my moment. Yeah. But when I look back at it, because yeah. everyone kept asking me, what was the moment? The thing that comes in my head was 1142. Um, and then what happened after that? I had to wrap my son Jelani in a series of tiles. Wow. For two days. And, you know, someone asked me on, on another occasion, because every time I tell the story, tears come up. And they said, you've told the story so much. Do, do you ever just like make the tears come up to make the moment more important? I said, no, I'm a mama. <laughs> yeah. Every time yeah. I tell the story, I'm a mama who had to wrap her son in a towel for two days. I don't get excited about telling the story, but I owe you the story. Yeah. Because you see public company. I, I run a multi-million dollar business. I travel the world. I inspire people. I live a first class life. But you want to know, more importantly, how did I get there and what was the inspiration? Yeah. 1142? It was my moment, and um, I didn't know how to get out of there. It didn't happen overnight when I decided I'm done. There was no, the ceiling didn't open up and lights didn't right, come down right. and, oh, oh, oh angels <laughs> singing, and all of a sudden everything got great. No, yeah. nothing changed in my life but my mind. I was bankrupt, and I love to use the word bankrupt because bankrupt means there ain't nothing left. Yeah. I'm done with this version. I'm ready to press reset. I was bankrupt with being broke and broken. So I began to search. I began, I became an, an explorer. I mean, and I wasn't a, in, 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 in school, I was a C average student. I never got above a C plus. I wasn't extraordinary in anything except for track. 
I just got to say, I was state champion Let's for the record. Go. Let's you know, I held go. the 330 little hurdle records for 18 years at my high school. I'm yeah. just going to say. But academically, I didn't surpass anything other than average. Academically, I struggled uh, for 12 years in school. I was considered right above special ed. Mm. I found out in my 20s that it was primarily because I'm severely dyslexic. Mm, wow. But I didn't know my dys- now I use my dyslexia for my advantage. Yeah. I yeah. teach holistically. Yes. I go back. I go both directions when yeah. I teach. Right. But then I didn't know. And so 1142 wrapping my son in pampers and, 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 and towels until I can afford to buy in pampers was my moment. And then I became an explorer of information. I knew that if my external circumstance was going to change, I had to learn what I didn't know. Mm. I had to learn what I didn't know because I was already using everything I knew and what I knew was getting me this, what I was receiving. So apparently people must know something I don't know. And I just literally someone who didn't. I mean, I got listen, I, the last time I took an English class, I got a fail. The last time I took a, a, a speech class, I got a D minus. And my English teacher told me I was the weakest writer she had ever met in her entire life in front of the entire class, what? excuse me, in front of the entire class. And my my speech teacher said, Ms. Nichols, quote unquote, I recommend that you never speak in public, that you get a desk job. I kid you not. I kid you not. Crazy, I kid you not. Crazy. So I had no confirmation yeah. of who I could become yeah. now, other than my mom and my dad. And they were just like, look, get a good, have a good life and don't struggle too much. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? It wasn't right. like yeah. you can have everything. It was just yeah. don't struggle too much. And when I told my dad I want to be a motivational speaker, he was like, well, what is that? Is mm-hmm. that a real job? Yeah. Does that come with benefits? You get vacation. Can you feed your baby on that? Like it was right. it wasn't even a created environment. Now it is. Now it's getting hot. It's popular. But it didn't come with any structure. And so I was bankrupt in who I had become. So I was willing to reinvent Lisa. I was willing to kill away any part of Lisa that was going to hold me back from being the woman that I hadn't even met yet. Now, that's a big statement, because when you kill away, that means you have to sign up for being in constant disruption for a very long time. And you also have to sign up to walk by yourself right, for yeah. a very long time, possibly. Yeah. You know, and so I was OK with that. I was OK with that. It wasn't it was scary, but I knew that I could not sentence myself and my son to a future that looked and resembled this. So I got a glimpse in a very, in a very um, real way at 7 11, 11 of the life I wasn't willing to live and the future I wasn't willing to repeat. So all I kept looking for are new experiences that didn't repeat this, yeah. new experiences that didn't look like this. And the further away from what I knew I could get, and I wasn't physically away, I was still living in Inglewood. You know, I was still driving down Martin Luther King Boulevard, right? Inglewood and house. I'm still driving my same little citation. I had a car that was so old, it didn't have two seats. It had the the one seat. Remember them old cars? They had the one seat. We drove one of them. My grandmother. Yeah, my grandmother had the car. And it was a hand me down, hand me down. I was grateful for it. And, you know, I couldn't turn left. And when I turned left, it got stuck. And then it came unstuck. And then it was dangerous. Everything on my left side because the car would swerve. And I was okay with that. I was going to drive that bucket to my future. If I needed to, I was okay with disrupting everything for the sake of something unfamiliar, an unfamiliar possibility. Now, I want to be clear. I wasn't running from my past. I I bring it with me. That's how you know. You know about it in my books. You know about when I'm on stage. I'm okay. I own all Lisa, every, every single aspect of Lisa. Eight months after that moment, my son's father went to prison. And my son is 23 and my son's father is still in prison today. And I, I had the journey of pulling the blessing out of that um, and, and understanding what, what was that about and, and, and finding forgiveness in my heart, you know, and not using that as a crutch, you know. Um, and so I had all these beautiful gifts that came wrapped in sandpaper. Mm. I, I had beautiful gifts, beautiful gifts that came wrapped in sandpaper. And some took me a month to understand. And some took me 10 years to get to the gift because the sandpaper was so thick. Yeah. You know, and so wow. that's who I am. This is just there's certain things I've or heard some of your story before, obviously. But um, there's certain things that you just expressed that it's so interesting because I do the same exact thing. You know, oftentimes we think there's this moment when something magical mm-hmm. happens, but mm-hmm. it's a process. And you actually did the thing that I do, which is I've never heard anybody else do this, uh, but I was diagnosed with this so-called incurable condition mm-hmm. with my spine when I was uh, 20 years old. 
and that was really my rock bottom. And, you know, I proceeded to gain a lot of weight and uh, dabble into depression and just really losing a sense of purpose because my identity was like, I'm going to complete school, I'm going to be right. successful. And now I just, I lost right. everything, right. even the ability to pay my own bills. And when I finally decided to get well, which is the key, and so many yeah, people yeah, look yeah, past yeah. that, it's right. mostly like, I'll give this a try, right. we'll see what happens, right. I wish this would change. Right. But I really decided that no matter what, I'm going to get well. You had certainty. Exactly. I it, it, and that happened instantly. But the process and it's not like the clouds parted. Right. You did Angel the Angel say, oh, right, right. That's what I do when I'm <laughs> telling my story. Right. And uh, you know, unicorns didn't come out, none right, of that. Right, but right. the the awakening process happened. Yes. And it was I just asked my wife recently, who's happens to be in the studio here today, so look it's so good. Um I asked her when we first met, did I tell you my story? And she was like, no, you didn't. It was just kind of like, you told me pieces, like, you know, this thing happened and, you know, you started to do this. Right, and right. But the story was still un unfolding. Yeah. And it wasn't until I met her and then several years after when I actually saw, that's when the transformation took yeah. place. So I love that, that you can, mm -hmm. and also bring in the past with you. It's not yeah. like you cut ties right, and, you right, know, right, it's, right. it's who you are. I need that. Yeah. That's the soil that this grew from. Lisa grew from that soil. Yeah. Love that. You know, one of the things that I'm also hearing in the story is something that we often do, which you made a decision to follow a path to find happiness and to find success. Yeah. But so many of us po postpone happiness. Right. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, we wait for a moment in time. Something has to happen in order for us to be happy. And to me, happy isn't something that you go and find. You can't Google download happy. Mm. Um, happy yeah. grows from you. Happy grows from a moment and, and, and happiness isn't something you arrive at and it's a destination that you stay at. Happiness is something that you seek to evoke and emanate and grow and experience and touch as much as possible and you're willing to leave it to revisit it. Happiness comes in freedom. Mm, See, yeah. it, whenever something is rigid and it has to stay, then you just left happiness because now you have to stay at happiness. Happiness is a place that you move in and out of and it expands and it contracts with you. Happiness is something you can measure. I always say I'm as happy when I look at my child. I'm as happy as his saddest day sometimes mm. because he's my heart outside of me. And, and so and then I detach from him. I let him define his happiness and I watch, you know, but there's never a moment I'm not connected to my child. And so if he's going through a dark a part, there's a part of me that is always with him, you know, so and, and, and happiness is not something that someone else can gift you. Happiness is not something your wife can give you. Happiness is something your wife can celebrate and elevate with you. Your children can celebrate and elevate with you. Happiness is something that you sit and you look at, you touch, you breathe. Happiness is something you take, take a step away from and you look over there and say, what makes me happy? I just spent 32 days in Barcelona. You had to wait yeah. till I came back from Barcelona <laughs> yeah. to make this happen. And I went to Barcelona for, uh, to, to, to put my life in three buckets to put my life in uh, the first bucket was this makes me really happy and I want to live like I choose it. You know how you can get to a place where things are coasting? Yeah, I, yes. I don't want to coast. If I'm madly in love with the time that I spend with my grandmother, then I want to be madly in love with it when I see my grandma. So last night before coming, getting on the plane and coming to you, I was in the living room dancing with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I put on some of her favorite songs. You would be surprised. <laughs> my grandmother loves Tupac, Ndiaye, and Alicia Keys. I don't, I don't understand it. Hey, but amen. no judgment right, 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 right. zone. Go my ahead, grandma. My grandmother, she, yeah. she's like, which one you gonna put on, baby? I haven't heard Tupac I'm in a while. Straight right, 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 right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so she was, she, uh, and, and I just danced with her in the living room because that just brings a sense of joy that yeah. I can't explain. I can't explain what dancing with my grandmother does for me. And, 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 and the second bucket, so the first bucket is to choose what I, wanna, what I want in my life, what I love in my life, and then to re-choose it powerfully and to let it be seen in, my, in evidence of how I show up with it. Mm -hmm. that I chose it and I choose it versus just coasting. The second bucket that I, I put my life in in Barcelona was I choose this, but it needs modification. It needs modification. Like I love it, but I, it needs modification because I'm tolerating some things in this experience that I would be happier if I didn't tolerate. Mm -hmm. But I love, I, I want it, I just need modifications. Yeah. I need some things to shift. Mm -hmm. I need some, some experiences in this experience to, to shift. And then the third bucket was, I choose to release it, yeah. that our time is complete. 
the 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 experience of living in overwhelm, the experience of saying yes when I want to say no, the experience of wanting to be liked and loved by everybody, the experience of opening my doors to everyone who who knocks on the door and says I need to come in, the owning my no so that my yes can become more valuable. The the experience of some people in my life that our season is complete. Like I, I, I put my entire life in three areas. I choose you, I choose you, and I wanna live like I chose you. Yeah. I choose you, but I need to adjust this experience so it can feel better for the both of us, at least for me. I don't know how you're doing it, but I need it to feel better. And then I choose to release this. Behaviors, thoughts, actions, and people. So I spent 32 days in Barcelona having that experience so that I can keep revisiting happy and stay in and, 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 and live and not expecting happiness to always be there as prevalent as those moments when I'm dancing with my grandmother. Mm, right. You know, and to allow it to be fluid and flexible in my life and to allow happiness to move away from me at times so I can honor it and own it more. Yeah. You know, and not to expect and assume. It makes so much sense. Um, I think that it's kind of ingrained in our culture because of movies and things like that. We have these very romantic ideas of, oh, yeah. for example, like the Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Yes. You know, yes, when yes. we have two incomplete people getting together, right. it's going to be some serious right, drama, right, right, you right. know, and, and not even putting that on another person right, and right, understanding right. that we're responsible for our own happiness. Right. right. And I we love, won't find perfection. You said yeah, it earlier. Exactly. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We won't ever find perfection. And it's a false hope that always leaves you uh, lacking something. But if you can find and, and discover how to perfectly work with your imperfection. Yeah. And what I've done um, uh, in some days better than most and other, day, other days not is I've learned how to dance inside my imperfection. Mm. I like that. And so I, I like love when you, when you opened. You opened with that. I, I loved it. I was like, yeah. Because then it allows us to be more, more gracious with ourselves. Yeah. I love those three buckets. It reminded me of uh, the Bozo show. Do you remember that? Yeah. It was like the the little game at the end. I was like, I'm going to get on there one day. And, and I'm going like to get the, little, the ball in the bucket. Yeah, right. and then the show, of course, was canceled shortly thereafter. Uh, but thinking of those three buckets, we've been talking a lot, and I've brought on some of the top people in the world just on exercising your no muscle. Yes. Right? So we talked with James Altucher, who yes. wrote the book The Power of No. Yes. Instead of The Power of Now. And also Michael Hyatt in talking about... Um, having those those standards because the reality is I think one of our big issues is that we think we have more time than we do, mm -hmm. you know, and to really take advantage of our life and this human experience and to have and to have our standards, you know, yes. for what we're willing to uh, take on, for what we're willing to accept and for, you know, where we're headed. And it's not that we don't love those situations, those people, uh, the environment, you know, it's still gratitude there, but you can't take everybody with you as well. And everybody right. doesn't want to come. Right. You know, right. and I used to have this kind of mentality of like, we're not leaving until everybody's on the right. bus. I'm going to help right. everybody. I'm going to help you help yourself. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the reality is, is, is when you look at, when you look at why we do what we do, like I love the study of the human mind. Mm -hmm. I love the study of behavior. Right. And, and when we say yes, when we want to say no, uh, when our ego flexes, when we, it, it comes from four areas is what I've, I've reduced. And, and when you realize that these four areas are false and they're just false illusions that you make real, then you operate differently. So whenever my students step on my campus, I say, listen, you're gonna, it's going to take you years to get to here, but I, let's, 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 let's talk about where we want to get to. I want to get to a place where you have nothing to prove. You have nothing to protect. You have nothing to hide and you have nothing to defend. Now, each one of those are big because we live in proving that we're smart enough, proving that we're good enough. Women, we want to prove that we're equal to men. Blacks want to prove that we're just as smart as that white guy. I mean, it'll go, it goes across cultural lines. It goes across geographical lines. It goes across economic lines. We live in proving. But if you can begin and just start now, I don't know when you'll get there, but start now living like you have nothing to prove. There's a, a, an elevated sense of freedom. Then, if you can live like you have nothing to hide, like there are no secrets. There, there are no skeletons in my closet because I opened the closet door mm -hmm. and I dragged them all out and I brought them with me because when you get me, you get that and I'm whole and complete with who I am. Like I've fallen in love with the darkest part of myself. 
And when you can fall in love with the darkest part of yourself, your insecurities, your need to be loved, your need to be approved, your need to be embraced, your 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 lack of clarity, your dyslexia, your if you can fall in love with the darkest part of yourself and bring him or her with you into every experience, not wearing it, not putting it out in front of you, but just oh, by the way. <laughs> I went on a date once and, and the first part of the day I said so let me tell you the, all the stuff I don't want you to find out about me so I can not try to hide all that mm, you know yeah. right and then you know then he fell in love then I had to figure that out because was, <laughs> I wasn't in love so but but if yeah. you can bring that with you yeah. so there's nothing to hide the, the third is there's nothing to protect there's nothing to protect. There's no image to protect. You know, now that my brand is, you know, a global brand, I, you know, there's always this conversation of brand management. And I go, let me have, be, always be a part of that conversation with my PR rep, with my manager. Let me be a part because my version of brand protection and your idea of brand protection might be different. And I'm committed to helping you see what's important to me because brand protection is not about hiding Brand protection is not about defending. Brand protection is about standing in my authentic truth at all times. You know, yeah. so I have some health things. I, I hope we'll talk about that. I've had yeah. some health transition. And that was a big deal conversation in my camp. Like, how are you going to tell people and what's going to happen? And I was like, hold on. The truth is sexy. Yeah, The truth is so sexy. Oh, my God. I'm so attracted to someone who says, so listen, here are my issues. Now, if you can work with that, we're cool. Like, yeah. like if you want, like, don't try to hide them. Just, just tell me what we're working with, and um, and so nothing to prove, nothing to protect, nothing to hide, and nothing to defend. There's nothing to Ooh, defend. This sounds like a tough one. It is. Yeah. Because our natural ego wants to defend. Our our ego will rise up and say, "I got this," and it's your humanity and your humility and your servant leadership that will say, "Hold on, I'll take care of this." And when you can apologize and fall on the sword on behalf of your brother, or your sister, when you can love the perceivingly unlovable, when you can love the perceivingly unlovable and you can forgive the perceivingly unforgivable, that that society will give you permission to not forgive. You forgive it anyway. That that society will tell you, you don't have to love that. You love it anyway. And you don't just love and forgive. You love and forgive out loud. That's when you have an elevated sense of freedom. And that's when you become a change agent. And your life, your life has a timeline, but your legacy doesn't. I love that. Infamy. So something I got from your book really right off the bat was it just kind of made me tune into the importance of my imagination. Mm. And you went right in on how our education system can kind of maybe accidentally, maybe kind of push it out of us. So can you talk a little bit about that and how important the imagination is when trying to construct our life and achieve the goals we want? Well, your imagination is everything, really. You know, you can use your imagination to bring the future into the present. Yeah. And that alters the vibration you're in and alters everything in your life. Unfortunately, when we're little kids, we're, well, first of all, we're encouraged to use our imagination right. because that gets us out from under their feet, the big people. Yeah. And we may be playing with pots and pans, but in our mind, it's not pots and pans. And so they leave us alone to do whatever we're doing. We're quiet and we're not causing any trouble. And so we're actually encouraged to use our imagination. It would be, I think, fascinating to see what's going on in our little mind when we're just on all fours, you know? Yeah. Well, then we go to school and that's called not paying attention. Right. And you get punished for that. Well, a kid's pretty smart. You only have to get punished for something two or three times and whatever it is, you'll stop doing it. And so we stop using our imagination. It's the most magnificent creative faculty man's been given. And then here we are adults. We have great big companies and little wee tiny creative departments when the truth is Everybody in every department is creative, but they don't know it. And it's the imagination where everything begins. The radio that you're broadcasting on or the TV that you're broadcasting on, it was nothing but an idea in somebody's imagination. Right. They tuned in and they could see it. And when they could see it, they were on the frequency they had to be on to attract what they had to do to manifest it. And the ones that were strong, and held on to their visions, they would win. But most of us were beat up about using the imagination, so we stopped using it. 
Yeah. It's such a wonderful tool. Yeah, exactly. That's and I, I just love how, you know, for me, it just sparked my mind and thinking of back, back to that time of being a kid and then working in clinical practice and seeing so many people over the years, adults and parents of kids who are stricken with a condition, you know, they're, they're dubbed with the title ADD or ADHD. And oftentimes, and, and this is something I love having Bob on just to kind of reiterate this, but you know, when we're, when we're at, the, at that age, one of the worst things that you could do to a kid is to tame them, you know, to take a kid who's all about full out play mm -hmm. and tell them to sit down for seven hours in a chair yeah. and behave <laughs> themselves, right? It's almost like some kind of weird punishment, right? <laughs> you know, so there are, this, things are changing in the school system slowly but surely, but it's just understanding we're setting ourselves up and our children for a potential lifetime of problems because even if they make it through that type of conditioning to go back and to truly be successful because as Bob mentioned, and I wanna reiter reiterate this point, every single thing that we're surrounded by right now came from somebody's imagination. Mm -hmm. The floor we're standing on, the clothes we're wearing, the the devices that we're listening to this through, it was all from somebody's imagination. That's how important your imagination is to achieving your goal. Right. But then I love the part about then you get on this correct frequency, this specific frequency. Right. And we've seen that happen. Like even with this show, remember when you were dreaming this up? Yeah. And we're all sitting there, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. You know, and Ann was like, well, how are we going to do that? Right, the how person, <laughs> you need the how person You got to have a howie, you know. But that frequency, I think, was then met because yeah. ever since, yeah, you know, and as we're looking, we've got the man, right. Bob Proctor, so, on this idea. That's what I want to ask you about, Bob. So what are some strategies or some tips? Because what you're doing is basically helping us to remember how to use our imagination. Wow, yeah. So well, what are some know, things we could do? If, if, we rem if we can remember this, nothing Nothing is created or destroyed. And everything is already here. We were talking about school there, Sean. I was reading something where Madame Montessori said, we send kids to school and we treat them like they're an empty cup. And we've got to fill that cup up with knowledge. She said, the truth is, the cup is full. Our objective is to draw it out of the cup. Mm. We've already got it. And if we can grasp the concept that the energy that we're made of, the energy that flows to and through us is a creative energy. And as we build an image in our mind, we flip ourselves onto a frequency of thought because thought operates on frequencies. It's energy. It's the most potent form of energy there is. It's more potent than a laser. And we've been given the ability to think. And when we build our imagination, we flip ourselves onto a frequency. Now, we, if we understand that, then regardless of all the stuff that we have to go through, all the objections that we run up against, all the walls we run into, if we hold the image in our mind, the way will be shown. Because we're going to stay in the vibration that we have to be in to attract it. Attraction is very real, but you can't attract to you something you're not in harmony with, and you're not in harmony with it if you haven't got the image in your mind. Mm. Wow, so true. You know, I got goosebumps. <laughs> I I think that it's probably one of the most foundational things mm -hmm. is clarity and getting clear on what you want mm -hmm. and having the imagination to think external from your circumstances is what I'm really picking up from Bob and. One of the things that hinders us, Bob, is that we feel that we have to do something. You talk about this in the book. I have to go to this job. I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. But you say that we actually choose everything that we do. It's not something that we have to do. Nothing is. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, if we let the paradigm control us, we have to do it. If we wake up, and understand we're the highest form of creation on the planet, there's not one thing that you can think of that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Everything is a choice. You know, J. Martin Coey wrote a little book. It was a beautiful little book. It's called Your Greatest Power. And your greatest power is your ability to choose. And so we choose everything we do. I was speaking at a meeting earlier this morning, and I was saying, you know, all over the world, there's people in traffic jams in their car. 
and they're going to a job they don't want to go to, they're working for someone they don't enjoy working with, they're doing something they don't like to do, and they'll sit in that traffic for an hour every morning or more, and an hour every night coming home, and they've spent their whole day doing what they didn't love to do, and that they don't understand they've chosen to do it, they could quit. But they don't know that. You see, ignorance is the only problem. When we eliminate the ignorance, Solomon put it very well, very wise king, in all you're getting, get understanding. Let's understand who we are and what we are. Let's understand we are God's highest form of creation. Let's understand we were created in God's image. We got the whole concept confused and we've created God in our image and we've messed up for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Bob, <laughs> I, I want to just want you to touch on this because I think we were maybe close to your birthday last time we talked. So how long have you been teaching this stuff to people and how old are you right now? I'm 81. Get it, Bob. 81. 81. You get it, Bob. And this is like five decades, right, that you've been speaking and teaching. 50, I'm in my 55th year, and I'm just warming up, Sean. See? I have absolutely no idea slowing down. See, I really believe the older you get, the more energy you should have. Well, yes. see? Because you don't get energy, you release energy. And if you study and if you do your work and you take care of yourself, look after your mind and body, and you understand the laws, you're going to have more energy as you get older than you had when you're younger. So you should be able to go faster and accomplish more. Yeah. The idea is speed up, calm down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love it. Mm-hmm. Speed up, calm, calm down. down. <laughs> Stay calm. <So> speed up. <laughs> in, in this chapter, when we talked about that, the fact that we choose everything that we do, you shared the story of Viktor Frankl and in the book, Man's Search for Meaning. So can you talk a little bit about that premise and the big takeaway that you got from that book? Well, Franco was, he, you know, such an extraordinary human being. He's a Viennese psychiatrist that spent the war years in a concentration camp. And he said, regardless of the intellectual or physical abuse that he was subjected to, no one could cause him to think something he didn't want to think. You may be forced into doing things, but no one can cause you to think something you don't want to think. And that's very important. I had an interesting situation, Sean, happen, and it's going to be more interesting, I think, tomorrow morning. Gina, who has worked with me for 30 years, phoned me, and uh, she said, Bob, we had a young lady phone the office today and said she thinks you know his father-in-law, her father-in-law. And then she said, you know a Jimmy, and I'm not going to mention his last name. And, and I said, I know him better than you. And I started to track around in my mind. It's been 54 years since I saw him. I was in his wedding 58 years ago, but I haven't seen him for 54 years. And I phoned him two days ago. And I'm going to go and see him tomorrow morning. I asked him what he's doing. And he said, nothing. And I said, well, you must do something. No, he said, I don't do anything. He said, I'm retired. Mm. He said, I go and uh, he said, on Tuesday is the only day that I'm busy. I go to an airman's club. He had been in the Air Force. And he said, we meet at the air, at the airport. And he said, it's sort of nice getting together and chitty chatting about what we did. Here's a guy, apparently he's healthy. He's one year younger than me. And uh, we chummed around when we were kids. Here he is doing nothing. It's like we came to a fork in the road. I went one way, he went the other way. And I thought, what a shame. And he asked me when I was talking to him, he said, do you smoke? And I said, oh, heavens, no. But I said, I smoke. I said, well, why don't you quit? Oh, he said, I like it. He said, that's the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is have a cigarette. I said, well, the truth is you don't smoke at all. I said, the cigarette smokes, you suck. You should understand what you're doing to yourself. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh my but, goodness. But you see, we both had a choice. We were going down the same path. Mm-hmm. At 26, I decided I don't like what I'm doing with my life. I was losing. I was unhappy, sick, and broke. And I made a change. And I have never looked back. He never made that choice. We all have that choice, you know, no matter where we are, because as you just mentioned, he can change now. You yes, know? he can. And we all have this kind of 
equal opportunity, but it takes us to get outside of our paradigm. And I just want to share with everybody this point. You know, this is the Model Health Show, so we want to slide in as much health information as possible <laughs> as well. Mental but the foundation, too. though, yeah. is still your paradigm and your mindset. But according to the research, individuals that retire, their mortality rate skyrockets. Once they retire. Compared to well, individuals who work well into older age, yeah. you know, continue well, because, working. Because, you see, work's made for us. We're not made for work. Work is made for us. Work is the, and we should be doing what we love. Yes. So work is, uh, it gives us, gives us the reason to have this mental activity. And if it's constructive and it's good mental activity, you're going to be in a good physical vibration. You're going to be in a good intellectual vibration. Do you know, I, um, I've been asking questions all over the world for a long, long time. And I boiled it down to three things, because it doesn't matter if I'm in China and Buenos Aires and Brazil or Europe or the Middle East or here. I keep asking people, what do you want? What do you really want? Because I really believe that I can show them how to get what they want. And I broke it down. Not everybody wants to be wealthy, but everyone wants to earn enough that they don't have any financial concerns. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing they want. They want to earn enough money. They don't have any financial concerns. Number two, they want to be able to wake up in the morning and be enthusiastic about how they're going to spend their day. And number three, they want to associate with people that are enthusiastic, they're upbeat, and they're doing something creatively constructive. But you know, they don't believe they can get it, and the truth is they can. And you know, you talk about health, that is the healthy state of mind yeah. that a person's got to be in if they want to really enjoy life. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I see this time and time again. You know, people would come into my clinic over the years you know, just like, what can I take for this? What can I take for that? <laughs> and of course, wanting some nutrition advice, some exercise advice, but I've seen this over and over that the most influential thing on our health and our well being is our relationships mm -hmm. and also what we do for a living. What we do. Right? Mm -hmm. And I love the, the, the paradigm shift that Bob's already providing today in relationship to how we view our work. You know, it's not that we're working, it's kind of like, I think he said something along the lines of it's working us or something work like that. Work is for us. Mm -hmm. Work is made for made us. For yes. We're not made for work. Yes. It's, see, the concept is that you have to go to work to earn money. Well, the truth is the people that earn the most money do very little work. <laughs> working, is, working is not how you earn money. Work is how you develop your mind. Yes. Work is how you develop yourself. It's made for us. So we should do what is appealing to us, what we enjoy doing, and give it everything we've got. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's dive in and talk about this right now because a lot of people listening want that so badly, but in their mind is popping up, you know, well, I, I've got these bills, mm -hmm. I've got all this responsibility, I've got kids, I've got uh, school to pay for, I've got all these things, how can I just do what I really wanna do, Bob? You know, all those things you mentioned are true, and they go on the left-hand side or on one sheet of paper. And on the other sheet of paper is all the reasons why they can. Those are reasons why they can't. Mm -hmm. And if they spend time thinking of why they can't, they're going to find it. Because whatever you look for, you'll find. Seeking, you'll find is good advice. What they've got to do is make a, a written, a clear written statement of exactly how they want to live. And they've got to commit it to writing. They've got to take a pen and put it in writing in the present tense. And then make an, just an irrevocable decision I am going to do this. I am going to figure this out. Now, a good idea would be to go to someone that's living that way yeah. and say, this is what I want. Can you give me some steps on how to get it? But they don't do that. Most people stay on the sheet of why they can't, and then they go and talk to the guy next door who's totally in cost in that, and they start talking about why they can't, and they talk about, you know, and and. They're involved with that. You've got to get involved with people who are going to figure out how to do it. And I really believe the secret is go to someone that's demonstrating by results. They know what they're talking about and then do exactly what they tell you. That is how I changed my paradigm, Sean. That's how I got on the right track. I found someone that knew a lot more than me. And he said, if you, if you will do what I tell you, you can have anything you want. I did not believe that. But I believed he believed it. And then he followed up by saying, Bob, your way's not working. Why don't you try mine? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I thought, you know, you don't even have to be very bright to understand that makes <laughs> sense. And that's what I started to do. 
and I have never stopped doing that. I have always followed the advice of people that were doing better than I was doing at what I wanted to do. Wow. There's something in the book that's reminded me of when you talk about going beyond goal setting and it's really acknowledging where you are now, you know, and I think that's kind of the, yeah, I see you shaking your head. So can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> well, it's everything. You see, I can say, I want to go to Cincinnati. But if I don't know where I am, man, I could drive right past Cincinnati and not know I was only a mile away. I've got to know where I am if I want to get to Cincinnati. And if I don't know where I am, it doesn't matter if I've got it figured out how to, where I want to go. I'm never going to get there. And where I am now, that is where I'm at intellectually, where I'm at emotionally, where I'm at physically. I've got to sit down and say, why am I doing this? Why am I here? It took me 10 years to figure that out. And that was after I was earning over a million dollars a year. Hmm. I had changed my life and I didn't know what I had done. And I took a look and I thought, you know, I grew up with the idea you got to be really smart if you're going to earn a lot of money. I'm not very smart. I'm earning a lot of money. I grew up, if you don't go to school, you can't win and won't get a good job. I didn't have a good job. I owned the company. We were in seven cities and three countries. So I thought that isn't true. And I started to question everything I believed. You know, you watch television, they'll tell, eat this, it's good for you. It could kill you. Mm. But we just watch the tube and create a head to match. We've got to know where we are. We've got to know why we're doing what we're doing. Why do I get up at this time? Why do I go to bed at this time? Why do I spend my day doing this? Why am I earning this? Why am I talking to them so much? Why do I pay attention to those people? We've got to ask ourselves those. They're very hard questions. And we've right. got to get objective. We're the only creature on the planet that can get outside of ourselves and look at ourselves and see what we're doing. And then say, why am I doing that? Is that serving me? Am I doing my, am I spending my days doing something that serves me? And if it's not, you got to quit. Just stop it right here, right now. There's somebody listening to this show right now. And what they want to do is get super serious. If what you're doing is not giving you what you want, make up your mind now. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to go to somebody that knows what the hell they're talking about, and I'm going to start doing it. I want to be healthy. I'm going to talk to Sean. When I get wealthy, I'm going to talk to this person. I want to build a business. I'm going to talk to the person who's already built one. And then do what they tell you. Yeah. You know, you in that in this chapter, you talked about how profoundly simple this is. Mm -hmm. Yet it people is are not. It is. It is so simple. And I want everybody to understand this timeless saying that's been just rippled throughout our human civilization, know thyself, mm -hmm. know thyself. It's really important to do that self-assessment and know who you are so that you can truly understand what you want, what you're capable of. But also I want people to walk away understanding your current circumstances is not your destination mm -hmm. necessarily, unless you choose to stay there, you know, because it's really your choice. And I can very much resonate with, Bob and his story and, you know, just growing up in very poor conditions for, you know, here in the United States poor, but we have to understand all of this stuff is in context yep. because everybody listening, chances are you're in the top one or 2% of income in the world because most of the world is living on a dollar a day, you know? So it's understanding we have tremendous opportunity sure here and even being able to step up and get connected to this kind of information. But I remember my brother actually uh, reminded me of this when we did the show talking about my story and I shared how when I moved in with my mom around you know age seven ish six or seven and now I can go to the corner store and buy penny candy mm -hmm. and I could take a dollar and buy a hundred pieces of candy he was like whoa bro it wasn't a dollar it was a food stamp Ooh, okay. so there was no taxes that's right, right? right. and so that's I came from that paradigm so growing up through that and just the messages that were ingrained in me you know my mom I'd ask hey mom can I have she's like do I look like I'm made of money <laughs> you know money doesn't grow on trees I was like well, it kind of did you know right, for right. a minute but you know and trying to push through that stuff and as I got older and started working I would make money but I would find a way to creatively get rid of it right. like it was just repelled by go. my presence and sure. for me it was tying to something bigger than myself mm -hmm. you know to help turn it around and I really figured that you know it's that Abraham Lincoln quote you can't help the, help the poor if you're one of them right and so I decided, you know, I could touch so many more lives. I can help so many more people if I build myself up in every single area so that people can't say, well, what about that, Sean? What about oh, this hole wow, in your yeah. game? Which you makes know? it, you know, it's not so much a, an, an account on you, like what you missed. It's another way out for them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I was going to ask Bob, well, what happened to your left side of the sheet yeah. now that you've done all that? Because if it's so simple you and we're so br- exactly, exactly, with no options of returning. And don't give any more energy to it. But, you know, you were talking about, <laughs> you know, how we live relative to most of the population of the world. You can narrow that down even smaller. Yeah. The people listening to this show are in a very small percent of this top percent, or they wouldn't be listening to the show. Right. So I think a person has to realize when they're looking at where they are, you have to ask, why am I listening to this show? Because there's something in you, your soul is craving more creative energy. And you are doing what you should be doing. So you should give yourself a pat on the back just for turning this on. Yeah. yeah. And then ask yourself, am I doing this? See, I've got this book. I've been reading this book every day since the 21st of October, 1961. Hmm. Now, I may read the same paragraph every day for a month. I want to understand where was his mind at? Am I doing this? Have I internalized this? Is this me? I read something in a book that is really good. Listen, the rich man, the poor man, the good man, the thief. Individually, so different is this same world. What made them different? Their perception. Yes. Yep. They were all the same. The rich man, the poor man, the good man, the thief. They're all made from the same stuff. They've all been blessed with the same faculties. They see the world so different, and they're all in the same world. Yeah. Individually. This is true across mm-hmm. across whatever career path you're choosing. You know, oh, even yeah. if you're doing something you love right now, please understand that there are people doing what you're doing that are multimillionaires, and there are people that you're doing that are struggling just to pay their bills. You know, there are personal trainers who are extremely wealthy, and then there's personal trainers who are living day to day Mm -hmm. and can barely buy food. I was one of them, you know? (laughs) And then there's individuals like Bob actually is a great example, you know? He shares a story in the book, and he started off cleaning floors, Mm -hmm. right? And there are people who clean floors, and he turned that into a huge multi-million dollar business, but there are people cleaning floors that are literally, that's what they're doing, and they're barely making it. And then there's multimillionaires. It's really, we, it's, it's the same thing, but they're doing it in a certain way. That's the thing. And that's what he talked See, about in that book. That, that's what got me. The book is about what I've learned. And what you just said is what got me to try and figure this out. Here I am. Somebody would say, you know, I'm earning all this money. I'm doing so well. I'm living in a great neighborhood. And... People say, well, what do you do? I'm cleaning offices, but I'm listening to Earl Nightingale's Strangest Secret, and I'm reading Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich every day. And then one day I thought, but a lot of people are cleaning offices. They're not doing what I'm doing. A lot of people have listened to Earl's record and read Napoleon Hill's book, but they're not doing what I was doing. So what is the difference? What happened? And you can be absolutely brilliant and be losing. Mm Mm-hmm. And you might be six bits short when it comes to being smart and be winning. Mm. It's the decisions we make. It's the choices. It's locking in. It's the focus. That's where the imagination starts at all. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that, about locking in. Right. And I just want to talk about a little point here. And this is straight from The Art of Living uh, from Bob Proctor and his wonderful co-author, Sandy Gallagher. And the statement says that, When you really want something, you will always get whatever is required to have it. Always. This is an absolute law of your being. And that really brought to my forefront that whenever we, in my life, my Mm -hmm. family, the people that I know, whenever we truly wanted something, no, let me scratch that word. Whenever we needed something, Mm -hmm. when our backs were against the wall, we always found a way to make it happen. You know, but the thing was, it took for things to be bad enough Mm -hmm. for us to move. You always have that capacity. I know this is resonating with some of the people listening. You've had times when you didn't know how you was going to get something done to take care of a loved one, to pay a bill, to get something you might have needed for school, for a trip, whatever it might be, but you found a way. And it's because the urgency was there. So how can we turn that urge into urgency, Bob? Is there any strategies that you have to to get people moving again? Excellent. 
Well, I think we have to understand there's no inspiration in needs. Wow. If you're working towards needs, you're never going to be inspired. You've got to be working toward what you want. I believe wants come, I think our spiritual DNA is perfect. There's perfection in it. That's the essence of who we are. And it's jabbing us in the consciousness, want this, want this. We might see a nice car, I want one of them. See a beautiful home, I want that. We see someone in a beautiful body, I want that. And we want these things, but we instantly let them go because we don't know we can have what we want. If you know how to get what you want, it's probably not what you want, it's what you think you can do. You've mm -hmm. got to go beyond your own thinking. You've got to get out of the box. You've got to get away from that paradigm. And when we go after what we want, it causes a respectable amount of discomfort because we're stepping out of the box, we're stepping out of the paradigm. Mm -hmm. If we're not prepared to handle that discomfort and keep on going, we're going to stay where we are. When we build the image of what we want, and lock in, we fuse with it. We become it. And that is when it starts to move into form. You've got to fuse with the good you desire. And that's exactly what you're doing when you build the image of what you want. You don't have to know how to get it. The joy of life is figuring out how to get it. it and you become aware one step at a time. <laughs> one step at a time. Just pay attention to what you're doing. Give it the best you've got. Robert Russell was a great author. He's been gone now a long time, but he said, there's no secret to becoming great. He said, do little things in a great way every day. And I thought, what wonderful advice. Yeah. It's so much easier to give everything we've got to what we're doing than it is to struggle. There's so, as you talk, I've got questions for you, and then there's so many more pop up, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that comes to mind right now is the discipline to actually do this, <laughs> and this is the thing, you like, you dedicated a specific part of the book talking about the only quality that we really need mm -hmm. is that discipline to do what you just said, but the discipline to actually do that, so. That's right near the start of the book, and for good reason. First of all, I grew up with the idea, I went in the Canadian Navy, and uh, I thought I knew something about discipline when I got out of the Navy. Um, that was a form of punishment that I mistook for discipline. <laughs> discipline is something you can give to yourself. Nobody else can give it to you. It's the ability to give yourself a command and then follow it. This I will do. You know, if a person's going to go on a healthy diet, if a person's going on a healthy workout program, they've got to have discipline. If a person's going after something they don't know how to get, they've got to have discipline. Discipline is the ability to give yourself a command and then follow it. This I will do. Now, doesn't matter what happens, you're going to do it. You're going to make it happen. And the reward is the satisfaction you get from doing something that you didn't even think you could do, that you didn't know how to do, and you did it because you disciplined yourself. Yeah. It's a magnificent quality. I am a very disciplined person. I wasn't always when I realized that this was really the linchpin, this was the key, this was the thing that made the difference. I made up my mind I was going to become disciplined. This I will do, and I'll do it. We know this, Bob, right. for sure. And for like sure. you said, each step then will reveal more Absolutely. and create more understanding. That's what Carlisle said. Go as far as you can see. Mm -hmm. When you get there, you'll see how to go further. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love the quote earlier, do do small things in a great in way. In a great way. You know, Absolutely. and that's what it's really about and the mm -hmm. consistency because success is not something you do every now and then. Mm -hmm. It's how you consistently live your life. And I love the word discipline because as soon as it as soon as I hear it, I think about the word disciple. Yep. And for me, that really means becoming a disciple of yourself and your own mission and your own purpose. Mm -hmm. And that kind of lighting the, the way for everything else in your life. You know, can we'll, have you... To, we'll have to do a show with you sometime. I made a program called The Mission in Commission. Mm -hmm. mm. You're going to find the people that do well, make the big dollars. They're on a mission. Yeah. And I made it based on disciples that I had studied. 
It's so important. Yeah. I don't care what you're doing. Like you're disciplined or you wouldn't be doing this show. Absolutely. CJ, they're making up those words. I remember the last time <laughs> I was waiting to find out what the word was going to be today. I found that fascinating. Oh. I, You know, the whole group of you there, you deserve so much credit doing this show. You you know you're helping people way beyond even what you know. There's people getting help that you don't even ever hear about. Yeah. And the universe hears about it though. And it sends it all back. That's a beautiful part. My first month I had to pay a $79 rental fee for my apartment that left me about, you know, what would that be, about $50 left over for two weeks to live on. So usually by the end of that two weeks, I'm eating spaghetti noodles, which costs like a dime, 11 cent can of contadina tomato paste, garlic salt and water and pepper, and that's my dinner. Ooh. And uh, today it would be ramen noodles, noodles, but they didn't have those back then. <laughs> And um, so anyway, I go, I, I go up and I run out of money, can't take any more workshops, and I start volunteering, you know, can I be assisting? And they, every, So I think I did like 37 workshops in 52 weeks, just, you know, wow. weaseling my way in, taking registrations, handing out tissue, whatever, so I could be in the room. I was hungry for it, because I yeah. grew up, I was totally into my brain, you know, I went to a military school uh, as a scholarship student, I went to Harvard as a scholarship student, and then I wanted to make a difference, so I wanted to teach in these inner city schools, and um, and so anyway, that's how I got involved in it. And then I met this man named W. Clement Stone, who was a good friend of Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. And they co-authored a book together. And um, he said, I want to teach kids to do this in the schools. T success is not a four-letter word. You know, they can learn to be successful. So I ended up getting hired by him to go and teach success principles, mm -hmm. goal setting, values. Um, having clear affirmations and visualization, taking action, responding to feedback, having a mastermind group, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that was literally, you know, here I was, I was in my early 20s, and that's how I got into all this and never, never looked back. You know, the coolest thing from that story is that you immersed yourself in that world. Totally. And so many, it's like one of the principles, you know, really of success. And so many people don't do that. They kind of like, it's like a part-time thing, you know, right. like you really got yourself into that world. I did, I did. I read every book I can get my hands on. Yeah. When Stone hired me for his foundation a few years later, I worked for his foundation for a couple of years, he made the mistake of saying, take any workshop you ever want to take, I'll pay for it. And any books you want to buy for the library of the foundation, do it. I've read 3,000 books. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them were paid for by W. Clement Stone. And I took lots and lots of workshops, but yeah. I was... I was so hungry for it. And I think if you want to do anything, you have to immerse yourself in it. I was just in India, and I was there for a month, and there was a, a man who was kind of my teacher while I was there. His name was Dr. Pankaj Naram. And his teacher died at 124 years old, so his master lived that long. And his master, when he went to work with him, he, he learned to do pulses. He could literally take your pulse and within a minute tell you everything going on in your body. It's the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in my life. And when he said, I want to learn from my master, the master said, great, you know, show up. And so the first thing he did was make him wait for 10 days to see how committed he was. And mm. then he said, go clean a bathroom. And he cleaned the bathroom and he came, said, let's go inspect it. And it didn't, wasn't all that clean. And he said, how do you expect to help people clean their bodies if you can't even freaking clean a bathroom? Mm. Right. So he got the toothbrush out and really cleaned it. But he said, you have to study with me for a thousand days. Every, every day you do what I do, eat when I eat, sleep when I sleep, eat, you know, drink what I drink, etc. And he said, you cannot learn anything if you don't devote a minimum of a thousand days to it. And we talk today, we get these books that say, you know, if you want to be a master, you've got to study 10,000 hours, yeah. you know, and that's the reality of that. Wow. So this kind of culminated, you know, that, immer that immersive experience mm -hmm. and you getting out there and teaching in the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, which is what a lot of people know you from, sure. which has... Just correct me if I'm wrong, over half a billion Half books a billion sold. books sold in uh, 47 languages around the world. 315 million just in China, another 100 million in India, and the rest scattered, I think about 100 million in America and the rest all over the place. You know, That literally takes my breath away yeah. because I think about today's digital economy yes. and even Justin Bieber's like videos don't get that many yeah. you know, uh, 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 views of these. Yeah. And this is a physical book. It's but he so gets empowering. more people at his concerts than I get. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got that. And then, of course, the success principles, which I have a copy right here. Yeah. Uh, this classic book, which has sold over well over a million copies yeah. as well. 
And what I love about this and what I love about this workbook, I, I'm serious, this is literally nugget after nugget of huge insight, real truths about success mm -hmm. that are often overlooked or they're not communicated properly. And the workbook is so wonderful because as you know, like unless somebody comes to an event, oftentimes they might get the nugget, but they don't do something with it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Devin Clement Stone used to say, you know, you have to learn what you learn, you have to simulate it, but then you have to act on it. If you don't act on it, nothing happens. I think it was Benjamin Franklin said, learning hasn't really occurred until a behavior has changed. Mm. That it was a lot of us have book knowledge, what I call having shelf esteem. You got a lot of books on your <laughs> shelf and yeah. but you're not you're not you haven't changed your life. And so what I realized after the first book came out and after ten years of it selling, you know, several million copies around the world is that a lot of people had read it, but they weren't doing the exercises that were in there. So we said, okay, if we were going to take a 17-week course and take the core 17 principles and say, here's focus one week on 100% responsibility, focus one week on clarifying your vision, one week on making sure you have a clear purpose in your life, and then setting goals, using affirmations, et cetera, what happens at the end of 17 weeks, your life will be transformed. Yeah. And so for a lot of people is people are afraid to go out. So now we have a lot of stuff on digital you can do, courses online that people can take, and also a book that literally you can work yourself through and um, it'll radically change your life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And what I want to do today is to go through some of these principles. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can touch on some of the insights and inroads into sure. doing something with them. But I just want to encourage everybody to get a copy of the Success Principles Workbook and go through it because the process of taking these powerful nuggets and actually doing the exercises is completely transformative. Thank you. And you've got it broken down into these different sections. So in part one, we've got the fundamentals of success. Yes. Championships are won with fundamentals. Absolutely. You know? And the big one in this one, cha this one changed my life. And I'm not sure if I first heard it from you or if it's from our mutual friend, Michael Beckwith, but I heard it was either you or him said, to take, you have to take 100% responsibility for your life. That was Michael Canfield that said that. Michael, <laughs> blend it together, I love it. It's my no, stepdad. You do, you do, because what happens is most people live their life from a place of being a victim. We believe that our world will be better if it wasn't for our parents who were alcoholics, or it wasn't for the government, or it wasn't for who's president, or the do-nothing Congress, or you know, all these things we blame. We blame the traffic for making us late. You know, we live in LA, or I live 90 minutes north, and you live down here. And the reality is, people are always complaining about the traffic made them late. And it's the same people day after day. It's called like leave earlier. <laughs> this is what the it's, traffic is. It's gonna is, be you know? there. <laughs> and so I, I have this wonderful formula that I was taught by a psychotherapist probably 35 years ago called E plus R equals O. Events plus response equals outcome. And most people, when they don't get the outcomes they want, instead of changing their response to the events of the world, they blame the event right. instead of changing their response. So two plus two is always gonna equal four. And if you wanted a five in life, you're going to have to do a three instead of a two. And then what happens when you have something like a, a, a economic crisis or the, the coronavirus thing going on? All of a sudden, the world's doing a one. You can do your two, what you were doing, which was working really well, but one plus two now equals three. Okay. So you're going to have to up your game and do something different. And so what I've attempted to do is, well, I've actually achieved it, is I've interviewed probably 150 to 200 of the most successful people in the world in every walk of life from entertainment, sports, government, military, whatever, and said, what are those responses of the successful people? What are the thoughts that successful people think? What are the behaviors and habits of success, highly successful people? And we can learn those. They're all learnable. You know, I wasn't born any more brilliant than anyone else. I just happened to learn some principles and apply them. Yeah. And so let's take responsibility, give up blaming, give up complaining, and give up excuse making. Those are the three things that people do. I like to say, you know, that uh, when you're blaming things or complaining about things, you know, that people, have you ever heard anyone complain about gravity? You, <laughs> you never hear anyone complain about gravity. Gravity's holding me down. Yeah. And yet you see all these old people with their, their walkers, they're all bent over, but they're never going, I hate gravity, gravity sucks. <laughs> One for gravity, I wouldn't be all bent over. And the reason they don't do that is there's no option. Right. So we don't complain about things where there is no option. We only complain about things where there's something can be different. 
So like if, if I complain about my wife, call her the food Nazi, you know, she's like, oh, you shouldn't be eating that. You shouldn't be watching that football game. They're making, you're getting all healthy. You're sitting here having Cheetos and a beer, you know, whatever. I don't do that actually, but you get the idea. <laughs> and so the, the, I can say my wife's a pain in the butt. Now I have a choice. I could either say to my wife, this is my body. You take care of your body. I'll take care of mine. Or I could go look for the perfect wife who goes, honey, do you want more Cheetos? Can I get you another beer? Because that woman exists. And I couldn't complain about my wife if I didn't have that image of another possibility. Mm -hmm. So people are only complaining because they know something better exists. They see people that are happier, healthier, have more money, are taking more vacations, going to places they want to go, et cetera, have better relationships with their kids. And so it's only that that allows us to complain. So whenever someone's complaining, the only question I ask them is, what would you prefer and what would you be willing to do to get it? Mm, and that's really get off that. My staff comes to me with a complaint. It's called, what do you want? What could you do to make it happen? Maybe there's something I could do to help. No complaining. And in my company and in my seminars, if you were to come, we have these two big fish bowls. And if you complain, $10 fine. If you're late to work, $10 fine. You make an excuse about why you didn't get something done when you agreed to do it, $10 fine. You blame somebody, the printer didn't do it on time. Well, you didn't bring it to them early enough to, you know, $10 fine. So it's really critical to take 100% responsibility. And notice it doesn't say 99%. Because mm. I always ask people in my audience, I say, how many of you would like to be married to someone who is 99% committed to monogamy? <laughs> right. Because you know that there's always that little out. Right. And so you have to be, there's no outs. It's just called 100% commitment. So what do you do with the fine money? We give it to charity. I figured that. Yeah, figured yeah, yeah. That. We support about three different charities. So this is bringing up a huge conversation. Um, I, I don't, th if there was like a kind of an anti-success method, it would be like the complain your way to success. Yeah, method, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just doesn't exist. Right. You know, and you mentioned in the book, you said specifically that excuses steal your future. Exactly. And this is like so many of us are like ready with our excuses yeah. and not ready with solutions. And I literally, even with my team, it's just like when you bring me a problem, bring a solution with you. Yeah, I do. If you bring me a problem, bring me three possible solutions. Yeah, yeah. Because one of them will exist. probably work. Yeah. But it's like it's, it's switching Start over. Start thinking that way. Start yeah. thinking solution oriented. Absolutely. Yeah. So powerful. So and just to share this really quickly, but. I could, the reason that this was transformative for me is I could relate to it so much because mm -hmm. I wasn't taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 20 years old, I was dealing with some tremendous health issues and I was pointing the finger. I was like, they won't help me. You know, the doctors, my family, all this stuff, I'm pointing the finger. But I, at no, no point did I think about what I can do differently. Right. And when that switch flipped in my mind that it, this is my body, my life, kind of like you and, the, you know, the Cheeto example, like mm -hmm. you take care of yours, you take care of mine. But this was in a healthy way. And mm -hmm. I realized that no one else walks in my shoes and I have to take complete responsibility. No more excuses, no more Absolutely. finger pointing. Not to say that bad things didn't happen. Right. That's the, that's the clarification. Can you talk about that a little bit? About bad things happening? Yeah, because, you know, when the negative oh, yeah. situations no, come there's up. Al yeah. There's always going to be bad things happening. You know, you're going to fall off the ladder. You're going to, you know, you're, the job disappears, technology takes over, things happen, your plane gets delayed, all kinds of stuff happens. The issue is how do you respond to that? Exactly. You know, exactly. and um, certainly, you know, I've, I've been divorced, I've had diseases that I've had to deal with, et cetera, you know, challenges, breaking my leg, skiing and so forth. And then it's called, well, what was I doing? I wasn't paying attention, you know? Like for me, I literally have transformed my diet in the last year in a major, major way. You know, it's much more plant-based, I haven't had animal protein for at least a couple of months. And I feel much healthier. I've lost about 17 pounds in the last 40 days. Um, and you know, the old thing about when you point to someone else, well, they don't make it easy in the restaurants or it's hard when you travel or the airlines don't do it. There's always three fingers pointing back at yourself, right. you know, and that's where it is. And people will say, well, I got cancer. I'm not responsible. And I say, well, do you live near an EMF transmitter do you wear i wear this emf device that keeps me my, my my whole body balanced and keeps all the emfs out here we're probably a lot of wi-fi in this room oh yeah do you eat an alkaline diet do you uh, do a, a, a fast on some kind of regular basis are you exercising you know 
all these things and they go, no, no, no. Well, they said, well, I didn't know about that. I said, well, whose responsibility is it to know about it? Do you ever read the manual of your car? So when your car breaks down, you go, I didn't know I was supposed to rotate the tires. Or do you take responsibility? Because this is a rental car you have for life. I want to stick around as long as possible. Yeah, and you are how old right now? 75. 75 out here killing it. Like, I have the feeling that you are you kind of just getting started. Like, you've got so much more in front of you. I do. Okay. Yeah. I do. That's 75 so awesome. years so young is what I like to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, you know, having on incredible folks like Dr. Mark Hyman and looking at, you know, we have our chronological age, but then we have our biological, biological age. Right. And you are clearly much younger than what the calendar might say. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and it's a big part of this is the way that you think and the way that you live your life. And I so, think it, it's yeah. a lot about what you put in your body, but it's also about what you put in your mind. One of the things yeah. I worked on very hard was forgiving everyone I ever had resentment toward. There was a shaman in, in Hawaii who basically said to a friend of mine who was diagnosed, she was gonna die. And he put her on a, on a, on a massage table and he said, okay, go back one week. Who do you need to forgive? And she was on that massage table for six hours, going back mm. year by year by year by year, all the way back till she was like six years old. And one week later, whatever she had, it was supposed to kill her, was gone. It wasn't on her body anymore. And so it's not just the biochemical stuff we put in our body. It's also the vibrations of our thoughts that are so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And these are the topics. You've said many things that we've talked about on the show. But, you know, our thoughts create chemistry in our bodies. And yeah. it's incredibly powerful. And one of the things that... Uh, you also highlight here is one of the principles there. And again, there's so many and they're all so poignant and touching and powerful. Thank you. But I want to cover these specifically. Sure. In the success equation, another one is to decide what you want. Yes. So using your mental energy to decide what you want. Why is that so important? Well, let me go back to my experience in India with this wonderful teacher. He said, he said, there's three things you need to know if you want to be successful. Number one, what do you want? Number two, how do you get it? Number three, how do you enjoy it once you have it? He said 95% of the people do not have a clue about what they really want. They've been conditioned to want stuff that doesn't really fulfill them, what I call the symbols of success rather than the experience of success. So they have the car, the house, the designer suits, whatever, but they're not really experiencing that inner peace, contentment, fulfillment that they want. Number two, do you know how to get it? Well, that's why I wrote these books, the Success Principles Workbook, so forth, is that most people have not been taught how to get it. Think about, it. you know, you went to school, high school, you went to college, I imagine, and was there ever a course on Success 101? How Absolutely to get, not. How to capture your dreams 101? I would have taken it. Yeah, Achievement Motivation 101, I would have taken it too. And so we're teaching kids things they don't need to know. Like, when's the last time you needed to know the three causes of the Civil War or the five exports of Brazil? A absolutely never. Never, exactly. And so the things we need, what I call self-science education, how do you educate yourself about yourself, yeah. we're, we're missing. So most people don't know how to get what they want, even if they knew what they wanted. So only 5% know what they want. Of those 5%, only 2% -perc know how to get it, mm. and only 1% know how to enjoy it once they get it. Think mm. of all the billionaires you've heard of, yeah. the Harvey Weinsteins of the world that just got sentenced to 23 years in jail. You know, they're not enjoying their life. You've got all these people that are drugged out in Hollywood who are super successful by the outside standards, but they're not happy. They're committing suicide. They're having affairs. They're, you know, doing lots of drugs, et cetera, to try to numb out the pain. And so we have all these wonderful rehab centers, half of Malibu. <laughs> It's a right. rehab center, so, you know. A, quite a few. Yeah. So it, it, it's that I want everyone to be in the 1% club. You know, my commitment is to end suffering and to help people, to inspire them and empower them to live their highest vision in a context of love and joy. So the Chicken Soup books were about inspiring people. The Success Principles books are about empowering people to have exactly what they want and how to get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to just circle back really quickly. Sure. Because I don't want to overlook how powerful... Um, forgiveness is yes you know I, I didn't drill down a little bit more and it's just just kind of been yeah, talking sure. in my ear a little bit but you mentioned this being in this particular instance something to help somebody to heal mm. um, it's part of that equation of taking responsibility for our lives and, and not making excuses because things happen to us people might have done us wrong but us care and I know that's something you talk about but us carrying around that resentment is dragging us down and keeping us from being successful. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, resentment is like having the emergency brake on in your car. You know, you're, you're, it's dragging you. It's holding you down. And 
the, the truth is that what I finally got to after years and years and years of this work is that there's really nobody to blame. There's nobody that really did us wrong. They were just doing the best they could to meet some need they had, some gang member who steals your car. He's trying to impress his friends to allow him to be in the gang so that he has a place to belong. Everyone has needs to belong. Everyone has a need to impress their girlfriend, to, to be loved, etc. And so if you don't have the skills, basically you're going to do the best you can with the limited awareness and skills and knowledge you have to meet some basic need. So I'm doing that right now, but I have more awareness, more skills than I had 20, 30 years ago. Problem with our prisons is we're not teaching people new skills and awarenesses. We're basically punishing them. The only new skills they're learning are from each other about how to be a better burglar, a better drug dealer, a better tattoo artist, whatever it might be in, while they're in prison. So when I forgive, I don't condone your behavior, but I simply give for myself to let go of this thing I'm holding on to. I had a woman come up to me at an evening workshop I was doing a number of years ago, and she said, it's just not right. I said, what? She said, my sister, my father. I said, what happened? When my father died, he left my sister twice as much money as me. It's just not right. It's just not right. And I had studied Byron Katie, you know, your thoughts are the things that make you miserable. And I said, well, how do you know it's not right? You know, and we went through that. She, she wouldn't get off it at first. I said, so when did your father die? She said, 15 years ago. I said, so for 15 years, you've been carrying this around. I said, how often do you think about it every day? She said, I don't know, six or seven times at least, you know. I said, well, who's making you miserable every day? Your father did it once with the writing of a pen. You're doing it six <laughs> times a day. Who's the worst abuser? For 15 years. For 15 years, you are, you know. And she finally got it. It took us about a 10-minute conversation after I'd done this little seminar. But so many people are carrying that around and not letting go. And so when I forgive, I'm letting go of all this resentment. Because in order to resentment, and when we get angry, what do we do? We grab someone like this and we hold on tight. And I, my hands are not open to it. They're not available to receive the new things. You know, if I'm holding on to this, you can't pick up my book and give it to me. I got no way to hold it. Right. So I have to let go in order to let the new in. Mm, wow. Um, so just going back to this profound understanding that we have to decide what we want. Mm. Why is it that we don't do that, Jack? Like, why do we not give ourselves permission to want what we want? I think it's a combination of things. I think a lot of it's the conditioning we got as a kid. You're not smart enough. Um, your brother's the athlete. You're this thing. You know, your sister got the singing talent. You didn't. You know, whatever. Uh, kids tease us. What'd you do with the money? What money? The money they gave you for singing lessons, you know? And all of a sudden, <laughs> we think we can't do that. Yeah. Um, we have a bad year in school and we decide we're stupid. You know, most kids, I was a self-esteem expert for many years. Most kids by the age of the fifth grade, they've decided if they're smart or dumb, athletic or not, attractive or not, good friend or not, mm. you know, scientifically oriented or not, musical or not, whatever. And then it sticks with them. So we make up these beliefs. Most of the work I do with people now, not most of the work, but one of the core pieces of work I do is belief change. And what we found is that most people between the ages of three and eight have made major belief decisions that are now still controlling them. Mm. Like they've decided I'm not enough. I, I can't ask for what I want. I recently got in touch with something in, a, in, a, in an experience where I realized at the age of pre-verbal, I was a baby. My parents, when I would cry, my dad couldn't stand my crying because he was real macho and it basically stimulated his tears, which he didn't want to feel. So he would put me out in the car and tell my mother to come in and leave me there until I stopped crying. And so here I learned very early, don't cry, because it's not going to get you anything. Mm. Being yourself and asking for what you need, whether it was changing the diaper or holding me or feeding me, doesn't work. So very early I had to learn to be manipulative and to be something other than myself to get what I wanted. And so all along people are making these decisions that I'm not okay, I can't do this, etc. And so we've got to go back and re-decide that because once we made that decision, we forgot we made it. So now it's unconscious. I'll give you one example of someone in a workshop not too long ago. I'm writing a book with a woman named Lise Janelle, and this was her client. And, and what happened was she was a great athlete, and every time she practiced, she got great times. Then she'd compete, and she wouldn't get as good a time as she did when she was practicing. And normally people do better in competition. So by having her go back to the earliest time she could remember this 
sense of whatever it was where she was stuck, she ended up back and she said, oh my God, I'm 10 years old. Well, where are you? I'm talking to my mother. What's happening? I'm saying, mom, how come all my ribbons, all my trophies, all my medals, you never display them anywhere like all the other kids' moms do? Every time you bring a medal home, it makes your brother feel bad because he's not as good as you. Mm. And she decided at the age of 10, every time I win, I hurt people I love. Mm. And then she forgot oh. she made that decision, but unconsciously, some part of her didn't want to win because it's going to hurt someone she loves. Once she realized that and let go of that, she was able to go and say, okay, now I can win. I realize I'm not going to hurt my brother. That's his issue to take care of himself and his own feel good. And so we all have these limiting beliefs that are subconscious that we have to surface and release. And I think there's a lot of unworthiness where people feel I'm unworthy of love. People that have had abortions, they feel often if they were teenagers, there's still this sense of I did something wrong, I'm guilty, I have to suffer. Um, and I think that a lot of times people literally just don't know what they want because they've been so conditioned to want this. You're, I had a client, three generations, everyone was a doctor. All the brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, doctors. This guy didn't want to be a doctor. He wanted to be a car mechanic. And so he ended up being an anesthesiologist, which is interesting because what do anesthesiologists do? They numb out your feelings and put you to sleep. <laughs> and yeah. then he developed migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. And when we went back through the headaches to what was going on, he went back to that decision that he became a doctor when he didn't want to. He stopped being a doctor, opened a garage for exotic cars, and now he has no headaches anymore. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. So powerful. Um, you know, something that really jumped out with me is, you know, in this conversation of deciding what we want, mm -hmm. we have to get to a place, and this is what I want to ask you, is in the book, can people look forward to, if they've had issues on figuring out what they want, is yes. there, okay, they can. let's talk about that. They can. Um, well, there's all kinds of exercises in the book to really get you clear about what you want, what are your beliefs to tell you you yeah. can't have what you want. There's some obvious questions that a lot of us ask in this work, like if you had uh, you know, $10 million and you never had to work, what would you do? You know, if God came down and said, okay, you know, there's, you'd never have to do anything you don't want to do, what would you do? There's a thing called a joy review. Go back to the times in your life you felt the greatest joy. What were those? For me, they were always when I was a teacher. I was in military school. I was the captain of the freshman company where you had to teach everyone how to do right shoulder arms and left face and forward march and all that because I was a natural. I was the head of my high Y group in church. I was the head of my Boy Scout troop. I was been president of my fraternity, except I had a beard in college back when it wasn't cool to have a beard. So they made me the vice president because they wanted to send me to the national convention. I taught high school. I taught teachers. So I'm happy when I'm teaching. Yeah. You know, so then I, I'm clear, I just want to be the best teacher I can and teach the millions of people to do what, what I do. And now I've now created the Train the Trainer program where we've trained, I think now, 3,500 certified teachers in 107 countries are teaching this work. Yeah. And that's very fulfilling for that's me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's what <clears throat> we can look forward to with the Success Principles Workbook is uncovering these things for ourselves. Yes. But another principle is we have to believe that it's possible. Yes. So when we decide we want, we have to actually believe that it's even possible. Now, beliefs are, there's two levels of dealing with beliefs. One is beliefs are a choice. You can literally choose right now to believe that you can have anything you want. It's simply a choice. Most of us are choosing unconsciously. We're choosing based on our conditioning. So it's, it's difficult, it's challenging to make a choice in the face of a habit. You know, like I always ask people when I'm doing a seminar, I say, fold your hands. Notice which thumb's on top. Now, unfold your hands and move all your fingers up so the other thumb's on top. How does that feel? Everyone goes, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, I don't like it. Go back. How's that? Comfortable. Okay, everything I'm asking you to do is going to feel like this. Mm. It's going to feel like it's the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But you have to sustain it. It's being courageous and consistent and persistent that allows you to succeed. And so we can study what are the beliefs of successful people. You know, one, one of the stories I love to tell is sometimes it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble, it's what you think you know that's not true. Like women can't become president or a black person couldn't become president of this company or whatever it might be. And I tell the story about this guy named Cliff in Australia who was a sheep farmer and he wanted to run a marathon. And he looked at all the races there were, none of them were available when he was available. And the only race that was available when he was available was this uh, six and a half day race that was like, you know, 575 kilometers, something like that. And uh, he'd never won a race before, but he said, oh, I can do that. He goes over and he registers and they said, um, 
you want to run this ultra marathon that's like six and a half days? Have you ever run a marathon? No. 10K? No. What makes you think you can do this? Now, he's dressed in overalls like a farmer, mm -hmm. T-shirt, baseball cap, sunglasses, and work boots. Work boots, not Nike running shoes. And they were afraid he was going to have a heart attack and die because he was in his 60s. So anyway, they finally let him run, and he starts running. Everyone else is like taking off like really fast runners like you'd expect. And he's kind of doing what they call the Cliff Young shuffle like this. Yeah. And what happens is he had a secret. Nobody knew he had this secret. The secret was he didn't know that you're supposed to sleep when you run a six-and-a-half-day race. So he was behind for the first two days. He was so far behind, no one, he never caught up to anyone say, go to get six hours sleep. On the third day, he passed everybody. They were all asleep. And he ran nonstop for six days, broke the record by 12 hours. And the secret was he didn't know you were supposed to sleep. So basically, a lot of us have beliefs about how much sleep you need, what you have to eat, what's not possible for someone like you. If you're a black lesbian with two kids from Alabama, you can't possibly do this. Not true. And so, you know, one of the things I loved about doing the Chicken Soup books was finding stories of people that you'd never think could have accomplished what they did. Yeah. And they did. Yeah. You know, and so I think you have to just choose. I can do this. And then, what, then the other thing you have to do, as I said, is you have to do some exercises like we have in the book. And also, people can literally come to my website. I do these free calls sometimes for like a 1,000 people at a time where I take them through this process where we go back to find the limiting belief and where it started from. And we'll clear like 980 limiting beliefs in an hour and a half. And then all around the world, just did three of those in January. Remarkable. And the exercises to walk us through that process or in the book. So next, I have to ask you about this because for a lot of people, um, you know, Chicken Soup for the Soul was a phenomenon. Yes. But you becoming like a personal brand and an entity uh, in and of yourself and mm -hmm. kind of branching out and, and having the success principles take off, uh, this was a big result of that personal branding was from you being in the movie The Secret. Yes. And in the book, of course, you talk about this topic to use the law of attraction. Why is this a principle that we need to focus on? Well, I think the law of attraction is only one of the things you need to focus on. A lot of people think I just kind of decide what I want and give it to the universe. And I think occasionally that, that works, that happens. But most of the time, the universe has given you something back, like an inspiration to take some kind of action, like go to this Starbucks instead of that Starbucks, or to you know write this book, or to start your podcast, or whatever it might be. So there are actions that you need to take. I always like to say the word action is the last part of the word attraction. So the law of attraction includes action in it. Mm -hmm. And But the belief that the universe has my back, the universe is on my side, yeah. that the world is set up with a bunch of rules that actually work. I like, you know, what Michael Beckwith, who's a good friend of both of ours, says, you know, the first stage is we think we're a victim. Why, God, are you doing this to me? Second stage, you realize, well, there are some rules. If I play by these rules, these laws, the law of attraction, law of compensation, all things like that, that Life works better. Wow, when I visualize my goals, they actually help come true. When I take action, when I ask for feedback, when I persevere, and, and when I pray, and when I be generous, and when I be, have gratitude, and so forth. And so then you're in what he calls the manipulative stage. We're manipulating the universe based on the laws. And then one day you wake up and say, well, after all these laws, who made those laws? Is there something, is there a higher power? Maybe I should surrender to that instead of my ego. And then eventually you start doing not my will, but thy will. And the last stage that he talks about, and I agree, is I would call it the enlightenment stage, is you realize you are God. Just like a drop of water is not the entire ocean, but it is ocean. And so you get to the place where, like some of these people I, I met in India, I was in India, guy's wearing a T-shirt, says, put your hand out. I put my hand out. He doesn't do anything other than put his hand on top of mine. Goes like this and drops mala beads into my hand. Perfect mala beads, 108 beads with a little end bead. And I went whoa. I said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I've learned to do that. That's a power I've developed. I can manifest anything. Mm -hmm. And so you realize that he's now a god, in a sense. Not the god or all the god, but, you know, a part of a part of it. So we all have these stages we go through. I think my books are probably mostly second level, how to manipulate the universe to get what you want, and then how to surrender to the higher power. So you're getting your guidance for what you're wanting to manifest in the world from a higher place, but then using the laws 
the, the, the techniques, the principles in the book to actually manifest that and make it happen. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to optimize your health starting today. And also make sure to click below to get a free gift. I choose this, but it needs modification. Like I love it, but it needs modification because I'm tolerating some things in this experience that I would be happier if I didn't tolerate. Mm.